Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, today I'm just share a bit more about the what you have learned. Uh, yeah, how do you see the future of uh, storytelling in VR? Because actually uh, recently I'm hearing a lot of more people talk about the telling story in VR, but most of them they are referring to something like this. They are using like the very consumer version, treated cameras that producing VR stories. Uh, well, most of them producing like travels, clips, something like this. They call it. they are doing VR stories. To me, so what? Well, that's uh, something we did almost one half year ago. Uh, uh, to me, the basic thing when you think about the producing VR story in 3 d format is you definitely have to create some very well friendly tools that you can work on and that can actually help, help you to really serve a purpose of a shoot in VR. So these are the stuff that we have. Uh, actually, it's quite uh, dynamic. First thing, because we have to make sure that your camera has enough room to overlap each other, so actually you can create a, a good stitching result. For example, like the, we talk about rigs, like 360 rigs, you yeah, can use six GoPro cameras to cover everything, but the, because of the original lens of GoPro, it's only 120 to 90 degree, which is only get probably like a 50 to 20 percent of overlapping with each other. So the, the room actually is apparently not very uh, enough. So uh, it gives example, like for example, the camera plays here, the safety distance is already like two meters, uh, which means once you step into the two meters, it's very hard for you to get perfect stitching when you have a moving object around the camera. So far, it's actually uh, upgrading the length of the camera, uh, actually can significantly help you to create a better stitch uh, images. And beyond that, as the video directors, when you think about you want to create stories, actually you also want to create dynamic shots, not only static shots. So you have to really think about whether you can use a lot of like moving motion devices. So actually we modify a lot of uh, motion devices, uh, yeah, like drones and the water scooters and moving vehicles. All those efforts will help us to create a better way to move the camera uh, by remote control. But there's also quite a lot of issues be happening. For example, if, if you talk about the uh, drones, right, strategically uh, aerial shot. So the strategically aerial shot, the key thing is the camera really connect to the drones. The drone will have, have these uh, vibrations. In the traditional uh, filmmaking set, we have this uh, tree axis gimbal to help the camera to compensate all the vibrations. But in the treated camera, because the gimbal is one whole circle shape, actually will just uh, install a round camera. Then when you shoot, the gimbal will be in the same. So you have to find alternative way to reduce the vibrations and stabilize the cameras, either by production or by post-production. It's the same thing like for the moving vehicles. Uh, we have uh, traditional like, Film, film uh, vehicle that actually can uh, carry like camera up to five to six kgs to move around like uh, with probably uh, 50 meters uh, uh, per, hour, per, per, per minute something, which is very ideal. But when we go to the tree shop, we have to place the camera at eye level, not at the ground level. So the vibration will be a, a lot more than the traditional uh, devices. So all this new way to be able to stabilize the camera, to remote control, to be able to preview, to monitor all the images is, is it's extremely important uh, to us. So, in, and also, in simple 3 d shoot, you have to always solve a lot of problems on set. For example, this is uh, some project we did together with uh, this very channel. So actually, we have to really find a lot of different ways to read camera. For example, the first one is uh, we have to read camera on a roller coaster. Then the issue is, because we are aiming to shoot camera on the roller coaster, so the camera have to mount on the roller coaster very tight but apparently we have no way really test. We have really no way to fail, so I have to do the testing first. So I have to take the roller coaster first, I will hold the camera rigs over there, I will feel the vibrations. Then I use some other stuff to, to, to really uh, test vibrations, uh, amount of vibrations, so I know that whether the mount actually can really uh, take, the, take, the, take the camera. If not, we have to reduce the setup of the camera, drop from six cameras to three cameras and to two cameras. So always a lot of testing has to be uh, done a lot of problems have to solve on site. Yeah, so like same thing underwater, uh, drones. Yeah, we, we crashed a few drones last time. I told you already crashed three drones. Now we crashed four drones already. But there's a lot of issues happening uh, on, on, on the site. Yeah. So uh, then we talk about the, the content. What actually we can produce? What do you feel that's more relevant? Yeah, we actually already produce a lot of uh, 360 stories uh, in very different uh, purpose and format. Like we produce independent stories with artists uh, like to share like local unique experiences and also we 
fly overseas to Nepal to capture the after earthquake documentary videos. I think documentary is very uh, good <coughs> content. That I think it's about 360 production. Yeah, we also work with like the, the government agencies and brands to create uh, independent documentaries and also kind of like a corporate video, emotional video in 360. But basically all these video projects we are basic in the purpose of sharing some uh, stories, sharing the, the world they are living, share their lives. So we feel that giving a 360 world is very uh, unique. For example, like the, this project against Blue Khan, we are covering, we are featuring this group of people that actually are uh, diverse, handicapped divers. So actually they are handicapped people that who learn dive in five days, which the, it's, uh, the topic is very unique and the scenario is also quite, quite different. So that's why we produce this content and she want to use this content to encourage all these other uh, handicapped people to learn how to dive. Uh, and works very well. And also some project we did with like uh, celebrities to for entertainment, for the travels. Yeah. So so we can tell that actually 360 video has quite very dynamic purpose at this moment. It's because this is the uh, very easy way for the brand to pick up. Because there are enough channels to share the 360 video like Facebook or uh, uh, YouTube. So for them they definitely know that how to how can they really adapt it. So then yeah further down we feel that the uh, 360 video, it also has its limitation. It's because when you draw the audience into the virtual world, they actually they don't really want to just look around. They want to do something else. They want to do some interactions. Because they feel that there's a freedom, they can look around, but they probably will expect a bit more. Yeah, so we actually uh, think about how we can actually make either a 360 video a, a bit more engaging. So actually develop kind of like an interactive measure to create interactive story that the audience actually can make a choice in the world. But of course, of course, most of the content that they, they are pre-recorded, so they can't really uh, walk around in the in the virtual world. But what they can do is, they actually can use uh, like cursors control to look around to make selections in the in the story. We also can <coughs> adapt this con concept to other uh, corporate applications like property shows, <coughs> channels, exhibitions. They're all along the same method. But for me, what I feel that the uh, Tristan video probably is not the end story. It has to be a bit more than that. And be more engaging, more interactive than that. Uh, the last thing I want to talk a bit more about it, delivery. Because uh, we also feel that deliver a treat TV online is one way. But when you think about want to deliver more engaging, interactive experiences, uh, the accessibility of your device right now is still in the early stage. Like here we already shift over like a million units. I think Oculus is roughly a ten thousand, uh, hundred thousand something, maybe some something, something around that, around that, around that number. So, which means it's very hard to for everyone to uh, enjoy the content by a mass distribution measure. Uh, so, for us, when we deliver some stories, so we feel that how we can create some uh, more practical way to deliver the story that we produce. So, we think about we actually should bring everything offline, like a kind of like event based. Not only in event base, we actually can provide all the equipment together so everyone can over to share the story together. And it's also because of another thought that we have in mind that whenever, whenever time when I share the works with the audience, uh, when they put on the VR device, we have no way to tell what exactly are they looking at. So this connection, this disconnection, they actually feel that the audience just isolate themselves in the virtual world. So for us, the one important thing is as a storyteller, the story is aimed to connect people rather than make them more isolated. So actually we create a system, it's an internal system called Story High, aimed to create shareable VR experiences. So we use this uh, system actually uh, try to make everyone immerse together into the into the virtual world in the different applications. For example, like we read few uh, like film screening. So in the film screening actually we invite everyone together to everyone put on their VR device. Then we bring them to different stories together. So I feel this Synergy is very unique because when they share the same story, their actual like, uh, activities in the real world become very, very natural. They really talk to each other, hold hands to each other, even when they are viewing the same virtual video, even they can't really see each other. Then beyond that, actually, uh, this method can also be applied in different uh, like corporate applications. For example, you talk about the property developers when they do a property launching, we actually use the same method to create like a collective shareable VR experiences to them. So everyone should view the same VR experiences uh, yeah, together uh, by guided uh, guided tools. 
So, so, so for us, we feel that the, when we talk about deliver a VR experiences for now, uh, for the more interactive experiences, maybe offline is a choice to the to the brand, or if you're thinking about doing some independent stuff. Uh, but of course, we have to got a number of devices. We are uh, we have a few. So there are already a few early adopters on this uh, market that we, we we can tell because we entered this market very long time ago, like one half year ago. In the time, no one is talking about VR. Uh, even the time that probably uh, China is also not that uh, not that aware of VR. Uh, then right now, we already work with quite a few brands and partners to develop some hardware solution, and these solutions and also like the uh, other software solutions. Yeah. So, so the way how brand pick up VR is very diverse. They might come to you to do like a uh, kind of like entertainment uh, stories. Or maybe they want to do like travel shows, uh, showcasing, yeah, or they just want to simply find a try. Yeah, but now is a good time because everyone, they are aware of VR. They always want to think about how they can really uh, revolutionize themselves with VR. So people who have the skills, have the capabilities to produce something that can help to renovate the, uh, innovate the industries, you definitely always have a chance. So another thing I feel that the, the challenge you are facing is the accessibility. So that's why I feel that the community is also very important. I probably uh, we hope to run a few more film screening events offline to yeah, just help people to have a taste of VR. So they probably have know that how uh, beautiful this medium is. The future of VR storytelling from now on we move forward. Like it will go way beyond the pure interactive video. So for us, we actually are testing something very interesting. We actually scan ourselves, uh, humans, and also scan the like landscapes. So we bring everything into the 3D world. Uh, so it's totally like we actually create a full action uh, games kind of story in the, in the full 3D environment. But it's actually based on the real world uh, textures. And we actually are using a certain like other technology like a sensor camera to be able to help our audience to move around. So they actually they can really put on the VR device to walk around without any uh, wires. But the, the, the key things about the the frame rate because right now we are loading a scene that's like heavier than 200,000 case uh, polygon that will run already uh, below 30 frame rate something. So we actually still are struggling with all this uh, performance. But we feel that this is definitely one of the, one of the future that we are talking about the storytelling in, in the electricity. The simply thing about if you can walk in the story, it's already making you very exciting. Uh, so, so the thing for us, I mean, we always try to believe that the, the purpose of telling stories in VR is very different from uh, telling story in 2D. Because when you produce something in VR, you are producing a work. So actually, uh, what you are doing, the activity actually is uh, also to share the share the work. That's it. That's all I share. Thank you. Hi. Thanks, Ender, for the sharing. Uh, is there any questions that anybody would like to ask, Ender? Oh. Yeah. So it so, sounds like in the end there, as you as you move forward to get beyond the limitations of film, which is that it's not that interactive, you're moving more into a simulation, basically <laughs> making simulations using film things because it's still your your goal to make something very realistic. But with a simulation, not just moving around, but then it's also presumably possible to make it much more interactive. Is this part of of where you see yourself going in the future for storytelling in VR? Uh, definitely. I mean, for us, the why does virtual reality uh, actually attract us is because of the freedom it provides. But we also realize that the first time when we put on the VR device, when we watch uh, even a simple physical video, we always want for a few seconds at least. But after the few seconds, uh, as a content creator, I always want to expect a bit more because I know that that's not the end story. There's always something more than that. It's just because of the limitation of technology today. We are not able to run it in the very user-friendly devices. But if you consider that building everything that's now we mentioned in the full high-end PC world driven by cables, it's already possible. I mean, it's for us it's always to, to deliver something when it's ready, but we always need to keep on improving uh, to wait until it's ready. Any more questions? Uh, if not, if anybody has any more questions or things that you want to chat with Enda later, you can just tell me that. You are assuming that the audience wants to be active in the stories. 
So for a passive for for a passive audience, if you put on a VR device and you're sitting at home, the 360 is useless, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you combat that? So your question is, uh, you mean you mean the 360 whether they want to interact or not? Uh, is that an assumption or is that a proven? Assumption? So it is an assumption that people want to interact. Okay. But if you have a room with 50 people, you will have a lot of passive audience. So how do you connect those that just want to sit and watch? I see. In terms of quality storytelling. Okay. Uh, what we have learned, because we have been running quite a few uh, events with a group of people, uh, we call collective VR trainees. Most of the time, they are quite happy by just sitting there to view the story, because most of the time that's the only thing we can deliver to them. To them. But sometimes they also feel that, oh, some of them actually stand up, some of them want to walk, some of them ask us whether we can walk around or something. So we feel that this uh, small bus comes to us feel that, oh, I mean, they, are, they do have some people, even they are also the same people who have never seen VR before, they always have this intuition to interact. We are, we are not saying that this is uh, represents to the majority, but we feel that uh, as long as there are something they, they look forward to, we should really think about this as a possibility to meet it. <laughs> Hi, okay, so uh, thanks. Once again, we'd like to thank Ender for 